Okay, so we will be moving into the Renaissance. So there was a greater need for math due to complex business structure, which led to a group called the Abbasist, which was formed in the 14th century. They taught merchants the decimal system and had advanced in, um, in the use of symbols. We also have Darty's cubic equation and Michael Stefel worked with negative powers moving into the Renaissance. We also have the first algebra textbook in, written in English, and we see a picture of it over here. And in the 1500s, Del Ferro discovered a solution to the cubic equation. We also have Cardano, who would later publish his work, as well as Raphael Bombelli, who used imaginary numbers, and Vietti, who used letters for known constants. And we're looking back at Darty's cubic equation, diving into that a little more. He was able to solve this by completing the cube. Okay, moving on to Renaissance trigonometry. So we see here they were starting to use it in their Renaissance art. We have a picture here of the Last Supper, and they use perspective and depth and geometry to kind of have more depth in the picture and look through it. Okay, we have... Regina Montes, he wrote the first trigonom trigonometry text, which proved the law of signs. We also have Redicus, who defined trig functions based on triangles, not circles. And Simon Stephen, who argued for decimal fractions, which tend to be what people like more as decimals. Okay, moving on to logarithms and astronomy. We have John Napier who published the first table of logarithms. Now this isn't exactly like the logs we see today. We get into a more modern log-based system with Henry Briggs who constructed, who constructed a modern log table with base 10. Okay, moving on to astronomy. There was a realization that Ptolemy's predictions about astronomy were not completely accurate. We have Nicholas Copernicus who believed that the earth moved around the sun we also have Kepler, who realized that orbit was an ellipse and that the sun was at one of the fo foci, foci excuse me, of the ellipse and that the earth moved around it in an elliptical orbit. And we also have Galileo Galilei, who defined uniform acceleration. And he was also able to determine that the maximum range for a projectile would be found if you shoot it at a 45 degree angle. Okay, moving on to 17th century algebra, we have William Ogriard. He used algebraic equations to find unknowns. We also have Thomas Harriet. He was a cardiographer, which means he was a map maker. That's why I have a picture down here for him. And you, um, he understood the connections between roots and factors. And we also have that vowels were known, vowels were unknowns and constants were known values with him, as well as Albert Girard, who introduced factions and used them to connect roots and coefficients and developed a fundamental theorem of algebra, which helped us realize that the number of roots equals the degree of the polynomial. Okay, moving on to analytic geometry. We have Pierre de Fermat. He found that two variable polynomial problems will give a line or curve, and if the power is less than or equal to two, it will be one of Apollonius's comic sections. Well, we also have René Descartiers, who used curves to create equations and was credited for the Cartesian coordinate system, which we see down here. We also have Jan de Witt. He was the first systematic algebraic treatment of conics. Okay, moving on to 17th century probability. Here we see a picture of Pascal's triangle, and here he was one of the first people to use mathematical induction for this. And if we look at the picture right here, how we kind of go through it, is that the number below is a combination of the first two added together. So one plus four is five, four and six, 10, and just that's how it kind of goes. Pascal's triangle, the delta combinations. We also have Christian Huygens. He dealt with the problems of expected value. And we also have Fermat who made contributions to number theory and used method of infinite descent.
Okay, moving on to calculus in the 17th century. So they were very focused on the tangents in the calculus back then. We have Fermat, who was able to find extreme, extreme of values as well as idea for finding tangents. Um, here we have Descartes, who found a circle is normal to its circumference and the circle's radius is normal to the curve. And looking at the picture over here, they used indivisibles to kind of break up the area under the curve and kind of approximate the area under the curve. And we see here that this would be an overestimation because we have some rectangles that they're calculating that are above the curve. And this is what Cavalier dealt with was he broke up areas in small region and they called them indivisibles. And John Wallace did similar things. He found that the areas under the curve y equals x to the p divided by q over zero to one using indivisibles. And his main focus was on the area of a circle. And we also have three different people who worked on the fundamental theorem of calculus, starting the foundation for it. And it was a little bit different than it is today. Instead of thinking about it as antiderivatives, they got it from connecting tangents and areas. Okay, and that's it.